Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we're going to look at the H stage pattern. And if you haven't heard of it, there are important warning signs, classic and recognizable, in the Gabby Petito case that women in particular can apply to their own lives. In fact, these signs, eight signs in fact, are so routine, a statistical model has been developed where virtually without exception, each stage of the pattern plays out before the victim is ultimately done away with. The woman behind this study is Dr. Jane Moncton Smith, a criminology expert based at the University of Gloucester in the United Kingdom, where she is also a lecturer. Dr. Moncton Smith studied 372 homicides in the UK and found a clear and predictable pattern in all of them. In this episode, we're going to apply this H stage pattern to the Petito case and see how well it does. What we also want to see is whether this can be used um, as red flags to help you in your relationships to remain safe. Before we get to this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So as a true crime writer of over 100 books, I've encountered a lot of deceptive and misleading mythology and cliches about crimes and criminals. There are still a lot of misleading concepts that folks think help them to figure out the red flags. Vague, opaque concepts like narcissism and disorders such as BPD and Asperger's syndrome. People think that if you can identify a disorder that you've identified a red flag. It's just not true. So what I hope to achieve in this episode is provide a useful practical guide, a simple to follow guide where actual red flags can be identified in a chronological way and you can use these to protect yourself. In an article published by the BBC two years ago in August 2019, Dr. Mon Moncton Smith said, quote, We've been relying on the crime of passion, spontaneous red mist explanation, forever, and it's just not true. If you start looking at all these cases, there's planning, determination, uh, and always, there's always coercive control, end quote. Now, in my experience, when I started researching, reporting, and writing about true crime, I invariably came across the same concepts over and over again. Many of these were clever defense-based conceits and contrivances that a gullible public began to regurgitate wholesale. Some of these included terms and concepts such as he did it in a jealous rage or he just snapped. Throw in the odd labels such as psychopath or monster, narcissist these days, and that was the sum of how folks mostly responded to or understood each and every new successive case, from Jody Arias to Chris Watts and everyone in between. As we go through Dr. Moncton Smith's model, and we're going to do so via the Petito case, I want to consider a few intertextualities with other cases as well. So as we go through them, think about other cases such as the Barry Morphew case and Letitia Stork, and how about Laurie Vallow? But mostly, let's look at it through the filter of Gabby Petito and perhaps your own life. Worth playing for? Yeah. yeah. So let's start at the beginning with stage one, and these are all from Dr. Moncton Smith, right? Stage one is pre-relationship history of repeated unwanted, unwelcome or unstable behavior. She uses some different words to describe these same scenarios. Now, in the Gabby Petito case, we know that both Gabby and Brian fought heatedly and repeatedly. And we also know that in terms of the timeline, we see some of this unstable behavior uh, going on just weeks before the incident at Spread Creek Camp. Rose Davis, one of Gabby's friends, specifically mentioned Brian having episodes where Brian apparently heard voices where he struggled to sleep and had jealousy and control issues. Stage 2. The romance develops quickly into a serious relationship. Ring a bell? 
Gabby and Brian were seemingly in a rush to get married and ultimately didn't seem capable of remaining boyfriend and girlfriend less than halfway through their summer epic. The fact that the status of the engagement was scaled back um, was an early indication that they'd rushed into things indiscriminately. But the real question is, who was pushing for a commitment? Who was pushing the relationship forward? Well, who do you think it was? Remember that post Brian put on his Instagram, and by the way, you do know that Brian's Instagram is no longer there. It's, it was deleted, I think, at the end of October. Stage three, the relationship is characterized by control, especially coercive control. We have a small peek into the dynamics of Gabby and Brian's true relationship beyond the curated Instagrams through what eyewitnesses reported outside the Moonflower co-op. We also learned from Gabby herself that Brian had locked her out of the van and was sort of ordering her to calm down by having her serve a kind of time out by herself. Besides all this, Brian appeared to be trying to control Gabby physically, including by seizing her jaw and mouth. That was something she demonstrated during the Moab incident as well. She also said that she was stressed out because he was stressing her out. A lot of this control likely extended into social media and how she portrayed herself and him and them and what he thought about that. If Gabby didn't do as she was told, there was likely a continued threat that Brian would pull the plug on the project and go home or simply not cooperate. It's also possible money or other resources were used to enforce a kind of control. I also think the fake final text about no service in Yosemite, as well as the bogus, can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. Those texts sent on August 27th. I think that also reveals the extent of Brian's manipulative, contriving, deceitful and perhaps coercive side. If Brian was controlling Gabby's narrative post-mortem, seizing her phone to do so, seizing her card, using her van and her money, um, what was he doing when she was alive? Stage 4. A trigger threatens the perp's control. Perhaps the ultimate threat to control is the ending of a relationship. Jody Arias and Chris Watts come to mind as classic cases who decided to seize control, deciding they will be the ones to end the relationship and it will be on their own terms. But the trigger is something else. In Jody Arias' case, it may have been a third party and or Travis traveling to Mexico with someone else besides, besides Jody. I think it was Mimi Hall, as it turned out. Financial concerns were clearly also a factor in the Jody Arias case. And I think Dr. Moncton Smith refers to financial stresses as something that could also be a classic trigger in stage four. In the Chris Watts case, the trigger was likely a combination of three things. The pregnancy, the affair, and an imminent second bankruptcy. In other words, financial stresses. If Chris Watts wanted to hold on to his mistress, he needed to get rid of the pregnancy and hold on to as much treasure as he could, something he could not control in a messy divorce scenario. In Gabby's case, it probably became increasingly clear to Brian that the relationship was on the rocks. So as time went by during the summer epic, it probably became increasingly clear that they were fighting more and more and that the relationship simply wasn't working that it was unraveling. There were anxiety issues between both of them, but besides that, he was out of money. That alone can be a huge stressor. When you don't have money, you're not in control. The social media element made that even worse, and the fact that they were, weren't really succeeding at getting much traction halfway into their trip were likely additional triggers playing into the pattern. But finances were clearly a very significant factor, ruining the vibe, as it so often is with youngsters in relationships. I mean, he certainly didn't seem able to foot the bill at Mary Piglet's or afford hotel accommodation um, for himself after the Moab incident. Did he decide to end things on his own terms? 
And that brings us to the next stage, stage five, which is escalation. Bear in mind, Dr. Moncton Smith wrote about this pattern years before the Petito case. On September 20th, I think it was Gabby's mother, Nicole Schmidt, who referenced, she actually used the words escalating tensions, or these words came across in the search warrant, in the messages she received from her daughter, that she perceived from the tone of these messages that there were escalating tensions between her daughter and Brian. And she probably didn't make too much of that because she'd seen these escalating tensions before, I'm assuming. Of course, this time the escalating tensions were life-threatening. It's likely during this stage that Brian not only threatened Gabby, but repeatedly threatened her. Threats may have included wanting her to be silent, and we know that was definitely a threat based on the statements made around the uh, Moab incident surrounding the Moonflower Co-op, the events that played out there, wanting her to be quiet. I think Gabby herself said during the Moab incident, uh, he kept telling me to shut up, right? Um, and so another threat could have been threatening to abandon her. You know, that was something she was obviously afraid of. And so threatening to abandon her, taking the keys to the van was perhaps something that um, he felt was an effective way to control her, right, through fear. If, but if Gabby called him on any of these threats, for example, if she consented that he leave her, he would have felt he had lost control over her and like himself. He would have felt emasculated and possibly taken this out on her. Stage six, change in psychology. Eventually, the perpetrator fully acknowledges and absorbs and accepts reality. He realizes th something isn't only happening, it sort of happened. And so when the perpetrator kind of gets real, he almost gets like too real. It's almost like he overcompensates. He sort of jumps the gun, as it were. And so in this process of acknowledging and accepting reality, Part of this process can involve a critical decision or choice. In Gabby's case, Brian may have accepted that the relationship was over, while at the same time feeling he had a score to settle with Gabby or that he couldn't let her go or both. Stage 7. Planning. So we don't know for sure whether Gabby's death was premeditated and we can't be absolutely certain Brian was responsible. What we can say is there was, a, there was a certain degree of seamless planning and post-meditation subsequent to Gabby's passing. I also believe the hitchhiker sightings at the end of August were part of Brian's plan to give himself an alibi. At this point, Brian still seemed to be attempting to control the narrative um, as well as his own anxiety. The decision to return home as quickly as he did and to use Gabby's money was possibly also part of a preconceived plan. If there was post-meditation planning, it's possible this was a premeditated crime. I don't necessarily think it was absolutely decided and planned beforehand, simply that he had perhaps thought about it and perhaps said to himself at certain times, if things don't work out, I can't live without you. If things don't work out, I can't live without her. Equally, that might mean, I don't want you to live without me in your life, right? Now we go to stage eight, homicide. Not much to say there. According to Dr. Moncton Smith, the only time a stage in her model was not followed based on the case studies that she researched um, was when the circumstances of stage one weren't met. And this was typically because the male perpetrator was simply too um, inexperienced to ever have had a relationship in order to demonstrate strange behavior in the sort of run up to the relationship. So in this aspect, Chris Watts is an interesting example of someone who had no prior relationship history, but that didn't mean he wasn't capable of criminal behavior when things got very uncomfortable and stressful. And I wonder whether the same doesn't apply to Brian as well, who also didn't seem to have any prior relationship history. So. If these red flags are too difficult for you to remember, and I can go through them very quickly, just reviewing them one more time, the eight stages of the pattern are 
a pre-relationship history, the romance developing quickly into serious relationship, the re relationship becoming dominated by coercive control, a trigger that threatens the perpetrator's control, escalation, the perpetrator is a change in thinking, there's planning and ultimately a homicide at the end of it, right? Let's go through it one more time. One, pre-relationship history. Two, romance develops quickly. Three, it becomes dominated by a coercive control. Four, a trigger happens that threatens the perpetrator's control. Five, escalation. Six, a change in thinking. Seven, planning. And eight, homicide. So if these eight red flags are too difficult to remember, the bottom line is control and threats to control and escalation and triggers. And ex just an excessively controlling person is a dangerous and perhaps dangerously unstable person. If not leaving a relationship is, well, let's put it this way, if leaving a relationship is not an option, and let's face it, it should be, right? You shouldn't be forced to stay in a relationship even if there's that perception that you are. But let's say for whatever reason you feel that um, leaving the relationship is not an option. Practically, you know, many people do stay in unhealthy relationships. So how can they be managed? And I do think that is the flip side of what needs to be discussed here. Well, I think you've got to ask yourself, what is driving the control? Is it anxiety? Is there a way to diffuse the anxiety? Is it insecurity? Is there a way to diffuse that? Is it inadequacy? Is there a way to diffuse that? Now, I'm not saying that that you are dealing necessarily with a reasonable person or that what you are doing is reasonable under the circumstances, simply that given this set of circumstances, this is one possible way of managing it, right? So one thing you can do is try to reassure a person. I'm not saying that that's a reasonable person, just that it's a possible way to deal with that situation. So try to reassure a person without enabling them, but instead in an effort to diffuse the situation, you want to diffuse the tension. That's really the end goal there, right? In disagreements, be less disagreeable. If you don't like that, if you don't like being less disagreeable, leave the relationship. If you're able to sort of swallow your pride and let this other person sort of almost take moral control or whatever you want to call it, you've got to allow them to win disagreements, I guess. Just think about it in a basic sense. Words are words. And if you've decided not to leave, then maybe give up some ground, if only in semantics. Um, it's certainly not my advice to stay in a relationship like this. I'm simply giving advice based on if you do make the decision to stay. So if there is control and if that control is getting worse, please get out. If there are escalating tensions, especially over a long period of time, it's only a matter of time before one of you decides perhaps to make a fateful and perhaps fatal decision about where things are headed next. And someone may make a decision about you for and on your behalf. Would you like that? A permanent decision. Remember, it's never too late or too early to start a new life. If the old life the, the life you have is already dead. What do you have to lose? So I hope you found this episode encouraging and useful. I really hope that is the case. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.